Yeah, dear Kelly, how are you? I'm very excited about the interview. Let me show you. This is new, your new flyer. Oh, cool. Yeah. Wonderful. And it says, don't be nice, be real. Um, in English, you would say non nonviolent communication plus intensive self discovery with Kelly Bryson. Good. Yeah, Sounds and you great. had yeah you had very beautiful uh, um, um, questions which I like actually, um, which we were thinking about. Yeah. yeah, to make a video, mm -hmm. right? And maybe maybe you can first talk about a little bit about yourself, who you are, and what are you doing, and what is so special on the work you do, the work you're doing. Um, maybe you can introduce yourself to all the people who don't know you yet. Hmm. Well, thank you. Lovely offer. Um, where to start? It's a good question. Where to start? I think I'll start from my heart. Um, I think my inspiration for doing the work I'm doing <clears throat> comes from having lived in a very difficult family situation and uh, we were at one point we were like abandoned basically and we were left alone in our house to find our own food and to make our own way and um, we really didn't have much support much help our community was not very supportive of us and we ended up living in different foster homes and being sent different places and it really inspired a big kind of pain in me a big confusion in me that i began to study psychology humanistic psychology back in the early 70s and 80s what makes it so difficult for us to get along as families what's, what's the big challenge how come we can't find harmony and love and peace and cooperation in our families and in our communities. So I began to study like what, what makes us human, what makes us really find our love and peace and support and cooperation with each other. And uh, I began to get my master's in humanistic psychology. And as I was doing that, I went to a conference for humanistic educators. And there was a man named Marshall Rosenberg who was demonstrating how to use this thing called nonviolent communication to work with a couple. And in about 15 minutes, he made more progress with that couple than I would make in a year of my own therapy that I was using at that time. And I was just really, really amazed and awestruck. And so I began to follow him around and take classes and do workshops with Marshall Rosenberg for a long time many many classes at one point he even told me he says kelly i think you have taken more of my classes than i have <laughs> kind of a running joke for us so i moved to san diego at one point and began to create a, a network a working group an organization to spread nonviolent communication particularly to the southern california area and that was wonderful for years, for 20 years. I lived there and worked there. And thousands of people came to nonviolent communication through our organization. And we sponsored Marshall many times to come to San Diego and to teach and support us in small groups and big groups. And then at some point I moved to the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, because I wanted to work with cutting edge organizations to spread this wonderful technology of nonviolent communication. But also I found out that after a while, I, after leaving San Diego, all of the practice groups that I got started that were running so beautifully when we were there, started to collapse, start to fall apart. And they, they just diminished. And what I discovered was, even though they had this wonderful, amazing, the best communication tool in the world, nonviolent communication, 
they also needed community building skills, community building tools. So I started to study some of the eco villages of Europe. How, what's made them successful? How can they sustain their community? And I began to collect tools and information from them about how to, how to work with a group energy, how to create a field of, of trust and transparency and consciousness so that we can deal with the big issues like money, sex, and power in a transparent, conscious way. Because that's what would be the downfall of these nonviolent communication groups. It didn't really know how to bring it onto the table in a collective way. So that's been my passion these last several years is bringing both nonviolent communication and these, I call them tribal technologies, yeah. different skills and yeah. You want to say something? Yeah, I want to say something. Um, actually, what really impressed me when you came here last summer, and I'm really happy you're coming back, because it's the same like with a midwife who already got babies, you know. If you are a woman with a midwife who already had babies and you're doing a house birth, it's a different thing as if you have a midwife who never had a baby themselves. So with you, I can feel you know, all these experiences and working with the people and the researching. I could feel like, wow, there's really something I can learn about. For me personally, that's not very often where I feel like, okay, there I really feel I open up to. And there I could really feel it in yourself. You really had the experiences. And one thing that I really was um, very fascinating by, fascinated by is, one part, your really your compassion. Like I felt a lot of compassion, and the real I really could feel your heart, like not mm. judging. And what you said mm. about the you call it threat, right? First I thought, cool. the, yeah. First I thought that it's a person I don't know yet, so no, I'm no. very confused. Like who is Fred? So maybe you can talk about that because here in see. our small place we already talk sometimes about like how is the Fred and things. You know, maybe you can explain that. That is very interesting. And it's just a word I made up to, um, to make it more friendly, to make it more accessible, less scary and technological. So FRED, the words, the letters stand for F-R-E-D, Frequency, Resonance, Energy, Dynamic. And what it is, is just group energy, how it feels to be in a group at a certain time. Like if you've ever been to college and had a professor lecture a group of people and all the people are laying on their desk and ah uh, they're just like want to go to sleep they're bored to death and the fred is dead we say the life in the group but when the life is really present when people are connecting with each other and dancing with joy or communicating from their hearts you can feel the group energy lifts up and people are excited they're joyful and they're present so the energy of Fred reflects the quality of connection the people are having with each other and with the whole group. It doesn't have to be happy, happy, nicey, nice. It just has to be present. Yes. Could even be anger present in the room, in the group. But if it's really on the table and present, and we're all connected to it, then we feel a, a very good Fred. We feel present, feel connected. We feel real. In the, yes. Yeah, through the unitive awareness. But when I'm connected with other people, myself, I usually don't feel much fear because I'm really in the here, here and now. The connection is almost a, a cure for the fear. It also contributes to my group intelligence. When the Fred is strong and present, then the group gets more conscious and knows what to do, as opposed to when the Fred goes down. I call it a limbic spiral. My limbic, my, my brain, my reptile brain spirals into fear. Then the group gets very unintelligent and starts to move towards violence. But to the degree the thread is good and we're connecting, we're present, then we have a very good access to our frontal cortex, our higher brain, mm -hmm. our compassion, our empathy, mm -hmm. our creative problem solving at a whole nother level that would never go against the whole, that would never do anything to harm life. 
because it's unified, it's connected to life, mm -hmm. to all of life. And there's a high sensitivity to what would serve life. Then why, then why is it that so many groups fall apart? Then why is it that even when you had all this nonviolent communication groups, that they, you know, that they not really connect? What do you think was missing there? You think it was an authentic way of also saying, here's also my anger or here's also my frustration? No. Why do you think? No, I think people had, I think people had authentic ways of expressing anger and, and truth. I, I think that can be there. And they can still have very big difficulties. Um, a couple things. One is sometimes people don't understand how group dynamics work. And um, like one simple dynamic that I've seen destroy quite a few groups is this tendency in human beings to turn against their leaders, the natural leaders in the group start to step forward, not even because they want the power, but just because they, they want to serve the group. And they have some skill and some natural leadership. And they step forward and they offer leader direction. And maybe for a while it's okay. But then after a while, people start to have their authority issues come up. They don't want to obey authority is how they see it. So they start to attack the leader. They start to try to bring the leader down. There's a book on it, actually. Wilhelm Reich wrote a whole book on it called The Murder of Christ. This tendency humans have to turn against their, their leaders, their spiritual leaders, their power, people of power, like Mahatma Gandhi, or Martin Luther King, okay. or John JFK, people like that. So when people don't understand those dynamics when they get started, it can create a lot of chaos in the group. Mm -hmm group a big one in Oregon last summer and the leader of the group said as soon as someone steps forward as a leader they get murdered they get attacked so people don't understand how this works and it needs to be dealt with on a collective level not just a dialogical level why do you think that happens why do you think what is there is a projections coming on the leader or yes. what is yes, that? something like that something like there They have pain about past leaders, maybe their, their family, their fathers, maybe their preachers, maybe their bosses that were not, did not have high integrity, that did use power over, mm -hmm. and did get their needs met at the expense of the people under them. And there's pain there that needs to come out and heal in, in a collective way, not just individual. Right. So when you do the groups, then you open up for giving room for the healing yeah. for each individual and the threat. So it's not about so much anymore about personal, about, you know, going against the leader and the issue between yeah, them. Right. But it's, yeah, but, but, you know, my experience last time you were here, I felt like, okay, that's very, very beautiful and powerful. And there's a small, but if everybody opens up, but what if, if people not open up to that? What if, if people, Still like this, and well, no there's not, here there's to nothing more up. touching. There's nothing more touching or trust creating than a person allowing their shield, their armor, to drop a little bit and to right. show their vulnerability. Right. If anything is going to touch the human heart, it's right. another human being being vulnerable. Right. Maybe about their sadness or their pain, or whatever the truth is. But it starts to create a connection and it starts to create a trust, mm -hmm. a field of trust. The more vulnerable and self-disclosing people can be, the stronger the field of trust becomes. Mm -hmm. And trust is the greatest force I know to, to allow, to invite this, this opening up, this mm -hmm. vulnerability to happen among all the other members. Mm -hmm. And it can't be forced on them. It right. won't be real. It won't be real opening. It's right. got to be allowed. Okay. People need to be allowed not to get in the middle and work. Right. They can be on the side for maybe 10 years if that's what they need. Right. Yeah, that is what I was really like, uh, I have to say, this is what I said also in the beginning, I was really impressed by your presence of not judging. I remember somebody said to you, 
what if, if I cannot open up now and if I don't trust anybody? And then you said, yeah, that can be important for this moment. And I was like, wow, well, okay. Yeah, I think it's a lot about tolerance also and a lot about at the end also at unconditional love and giving the room. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also interesting because you said you, you worked out some some skills. Can you explain the skills? like? What skills? You mean in the uh, working with the group? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's this one tool we use. It's a very good one. It's one of the best collective tools I know. It's called the SD Forum or the, or the ZEG Forum. And um, in the ZEG Forum, there's this opportunity for individuals to stand up and, and do their own work on themselves. And, but it takes some skills on the part of the facilitator to not try to fix the person, mm -hmm. to not try to lead them, mm -hmm. to not try to direct them, but only to support, allow, encourage playfully with humor and compassion what's in there to come onto the table. Mm -hmm. Just bringing it out, making it transparent, starts the self-healing process. Mm -hmm. And the self-healing is what does the magic but it's getting it out on the table in a gentle way without force to hold a space that allows the vulnerability to ripen. Mm -hmm. And as it ripens, then it, it'll fall naturally, organically, to not push it. Yeah, thank you. But for one, big skill, one big skill that the facilitator needs is to know when to trust his impulses. Mm -hmm. And when there's no impulse there, to do nothing. Mm. Yeah. Doing nothing yeah. well is a is a profound skill. What was really like kind of like getting me, you know, you said something last time like all problems we have in the world, like you said like money, power, right? Power and what else? Sexuality and love. And love. Uh, will also and love will also come up in each community. Why is that? And what is happening if that comes up? And why is that? You know that it has to come up. You know, is that energy healing of the also in the, at the end of the whole field of the actually let's say on the energy field on the consciousness on human level at all or only on that one community? Oh no, it's. It's every community I've ever, ever worked with. Those four things are always either on the table consciously or they're directing the community in the subconscious. They're being, it's like what's unconscious controls you. What you're conscious of, you can have some control with. So those four things I think are directing communities either more or less consciously. Some communities have decided not to talk about certain things. Say, for example, money. They just don't talk about it. And so, unconsciously, it's kind of running the show. It's running the community, but from a, a disconnected, unconscious place. Mm -hmm. Same with power dynamics. Mm -hmm. Same with sexuality. Mm -hmm. If it's not transparent, it's probably running the show unconsciously. So it always creates a threat, even if we yeah. talk about things or don't talk about it, the energy is there. And it's fascinating to be in a community and be sitting there and the fret is dead. Everyone's kind of like, like bored. And then I'll, I'll invite the elephants to come out. I'll say, <laughs> who's sitting on an elephant? Mm -hmm. And often it's me. And it's my frustration with the group that they don't trust to open up or something. So mm -hmm. I need to expose my elephant. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I offer this invitation to, to bring what people are sitting on, whether it's anger, whether it's sadness, whether it's joy, and to bring it onto the table, immediately the presence goes up. Mm -hmm. As soon as someone shares what they've been hiding, the attention gets clearer and stronger. Mm -hmm. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. And also, you know, one sentence we put also in the brochure to 
tell about you. Um, let me try to say in English, it needs a community to develop consciousness. Absolutely. So, in English, we have a phrase that says, it's from the African tribe, it's actually, it takes a village to raise a child, is what the famous African saying is, but mm -hmm. I think it takes a village to raise a consciousness. Mm -hmm. To be a social being, we need social feedback. Mm -hmm. Without social feedback, how do we know how we're affecting people, how we're landing? Right. And also, the, the more we can give this kind of feedback, sometimes we call it rough love. To give this kind of feedback from the intention to support the awakening, the liberation, mm -hmm. the becoming more conscious of the other person. If we give it for that reason, and we have good skills to say it in a non-violent way, non-judging way, it's much more likely to land and to have a, a liberating, awakening effect on the other person. So they can gain new perspectives on how to live their lives more fully. Right, and I think there's, I mean, I think there's a lot of fear, you know? I mean, to, to be judged and to also judging and to talk up and maybe hurting somebody, saying something wrong and then maybe hurting somebody or get hurt. And I think that is the reason why many people don't really connect, right? Because yes. of fear. Well, also, they don't have confidence that they can clean up a mess if they make one. Mm -hmm. Marshall Rosenberg would say, I have no confidence I'm not going to trigger pain for people or make a mess emotionally and create conflict and upheaval. I have no confidence that I'm not going to stir up a whole lot of triggers for people. He said, my confidence comes from My, my knowing I can have some skills at cleaning it up and giving the empathy to the other person once they are triggered mm -hmm. to help them heal from whatever the trigger is. But also it helps to have some principles in mind. For example, Marshall would say, no one has ever hurt anyone. No one has ever hurt anyone's feelings. When I think I've caused your pain, I can't have compassion and empathy for it. When I know that I'm the trigger for your pain, I'm the trigger for your past hurts and wounds and unhealed energies, I'm a trigger, I'm a catalyst, then I can have the detachment it takes to have compassion for it, the empathy. But if I think I hurt your feelings, then all I can do is go off on a guilt trip and right. feel guilty about it and not be present to, to the person who got triggered. Right, right. Some, and it really helps to have a village of people who understand these principles and are holding these principles together instead of making, stepping into the victim perpetrator rescuer dynamics mm -hmm. and making the person wrong that triggered the other person, calling them the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And the poor victim we disempower, we say they, they had no choice but to be triggered, mm -hmm. which disempowers them. And it prevents this growth, this maturing from taking place. Mm -hmm. But if you have a community that's holding that, those ideas and that consciousness and those principles, it's a lot easier. Okay. Can you give an ex experience, like, or some, can you paint a picture for people who never experienced something like this, like how that could be, like an example? An example of, of a community that holds those principles or an example of healing between people who've triggered each other? Like an example of healing. Okay. There's, there's the lots. There's, <laughs> that would be good. Hmm. Okay. Yes, I can remember one. There was this father one time, and he brought his daughter to see me. Um, I'm also a licensed marriage and family therapist, so I work with families a bit. His father came, and um, he brought his daughter. And many years ago, like several years ago in their relationship, like I think she was like 19. And so something like when she was like eight or nine years old, he sexually molested her. Mm. And this really created a horrible loss of trust for this young woman. And her life was really very, very painful. And she, her whole life was about trying to heal from this these things that got set in motion at that time. And she really wanted to heal it for her own mental health. 
And she brought her father in to see me to try to heal and work with this thing. That's a heavy that thing. Very, pardon me? That's a heavy thing. That's a very heavy thing. And, you know, archetypally, it's, it's, it's a very big issue of, of how patriarchal misuse of nature happens and the effects of that. But anyway, on the very personal level, she, um, it took us a long time to allow me to play the role of her father, listening to what it had cost her to have had this happen between the father and the daughter. And there was a lot of rage. And, and I just held space and I asked father just to sit there, to not do anything but sit there. And I took his role on and I, I gave empathy to the young woman, to all of her rage and all that it cost her in her life and the pain and the confusion and the relationships that were fell apart and her whole life and how it was affected by this. And it took hours. And I listened with all the empathy I could muster. <clears throat> and then at some point I said, so now, now I need to switch to stage two healing, which means now that she's been heard deeply and fully and totally about her pain, now I ask her to hear what was going on with father when he was doing this, what was really, really happening inside of him. And I took his role and I, I gave honesty about the, the horrible self-hate and contempt for my own sexuality that I was feeling, how ashamed I was to present it to any, anybody else. And I, I asked her to listen and she did. But at one point the father said, I can't receive this sympathy. It's too, I don't deserve it. I'm, I'm such an awful, creature that I, have, I don't deserve any compassion, any empathy. And I said to him, if you don't allow this empathy to come in and affect you and heal you, then you won't be present for your daughter for supporting her in the future to help her heal. He said, okay, for that reason, I'll receive the empathy to help her heal. I'll, I'll receive. So I continued and um, the daughter was powerful and beautiful and she was able to connect and hear what was alive in Father, it was behind the rage, the contempt, the disgust that was running his life. And she heard it deeply. And the Father was deeply affected by this, that this daughter could do this, could have empathy for him after what he had done to her. And I watched them as they went out to the parking lot. After the session, they just... They just hugged each other. Wow. They just grabbed each other and held each other and hugged each other. And there was such an energy of love that had been trapped, that had been blocked for all those years. It was, I could feel it. I could see it in their hug in my parking lot in my office. Wow. And that was the real payment. That's, that's the real reward. That's why I'm really doing this thing. Wow. Thank you for sharing, Kelly. Wow. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm coming from an Indian tradition and we also say if we don't um, take responsibility for our actions, then, you know, we create a lot of follow-up energies. And I see that in my work, that maybe, that many times, maybe many times, kids also overtake the issues if they are not solved. So, you know, when you're solving something big like this, this is amazing because even for the next generations, it's, you know, it's very, very important that this energy is clear. And it's even more powerful to do it in a group setting. Mm -hmm. When you have a circle of people because all that presence, all that attention, all that love can, can be focused on creating a healing energy field. Wow. And also the other people who have anything related to this kind of thing. Um, there's a saying Carl Rogers, that great humanist psychologist said, that the more personal the issue, the more universal it is. So it may not be father, daughter, but it's boyfriend, girlfriend, and the violation that happened there, the, mm -hmm. the pain that happened there. But people can piggyback on this. You can have 50 people having a healing experience, uh, just as we work with the one, one father, daughter situation. Wow. Yeah, it, was, it was very, very intense when you're here. I mean, <laughs> I experienced feel like 
wow, this is uh, really powerful to go into the circle, to expose yourself, to, to work. And I saw also when I went into the circle, I saw that also later on people told me they had their own stories also in that. And that is exactly what you're saying. So it, it, it feels a, a thread of different, let's say, of individual different stories which we even don't know, you know, which is not possible. Yeah. So, so actually, why do you think then that if, if each community has some issues, which is normal then, because some universal issues yeah. just have to be healed, but then why? Yeah, because so it's part of humanity. Right. But, but why so less communities are able to, to handle it well? Or you, you said so many communities break out together, even they do yoga, even they do, um, you know, different ways of communicating. Why, why is so much fear to really connect with each other? What do you think? Or, or why, what is that? Why is it so much fear? Or, or why doesn't it happen? Or why, why do they fail? Too many questions of one. Why, why, yeah. why is it, yeah. So why is that that, they, that so many communities fall apart? Well, one thing is, is when they get started in the beginning, when they're starting, what most community people do is they get together with each other and they start to dream and vision and write about their visions and their dreams. And everybody kind of offers their different uh, perspectives and, and principles and ideas about what the vision for the community would be. Yeah. And that's how I start. And I've done many of those uh, in the last 35 years. I've had many meetings like that, big meetings, 75, 80 people would come and everybody would share their vision. We'd have a vision board and we'd spend a lot of time with it. And sometimes the community would get started from that. Sometimes it wouldn't. But the big mistake that's being made is they're not really clarifying the issues between them first not really doing what what the, the Z community and the Tamara community and others are saying is to study first mm -hmm. study what have the past communities done what made them fail what's really needed mm -hmm. what do we believe spiritually mm -hmm. what do we believe around the, the sexual dimension mm -hmm. what what's going on what do we what information can we gather to understand about power dynamics mm -hmm. can we get deep in our thought with each other, deep in communication with each other, deep in rapport with each other. And after we do that, and that may take months, then we start talking about a vision. Mm -hmm. Then it's more of a shared collective vision. Then it's more of a thought out vision. Mm -hmm. It's more connected to higher consciousness. Mm -hmm. And also I think the communities don't really know how to pray well together. There's how to have deep prayer and how to cultivate, cultivate this vision inside of themselves, mm -hmm. and how to tune into the entelechy of their particular community. Mm -hmm. So the entelechy itself can, can lead the community. They try to do it from an ego place, mm -hmm. from a place of just the thought world, just the linear mm -hmm. mind, right, right. and not the, the, ah. the non-linear, the mm -hmm. unitive awareness. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, both, both are needed, the conceptual, yeah. the conceptual knowledge mm -hmm. and this kind of spiritual unity of nonlinear mm -hmm. awareness too. They, we need both. What for me was also very interesting personally is that I only heard last year about nonviolent communication. And then later on, even after your visit, mm -hmm. I actually realized how special that really was to have you here, that you connected so deeply to Rosina. Because I heard some of his talks and I was like, whoa, that's really pretty deep. He, he, was, very, uh, he was very special. For me, the first thought that came up was when I heard nonviolent communication, I first thought, we don't talk in violence. But after yeah. I listened to all that, I start to realize, oh my gosh, I'm talking violent or somebody talks violent and whoa, that's a big, you know, that's a big realization, you know. Yeah. So can you tell a little bit about your time with, with, with him and what Oh, you I'd love to do that. <laughs> one of my very favorite things in the world to do is to remember the many, many times 
that I got to be with Marshall. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you one, I'll tell you one little story perhaps, it just comes to mind. So I had this, we had a 10 day workshop with 10 people and Marshall was one of them. And so it was very intense, very deep work we were doing, very deep empathy and healing work. And I was doing work on my family. My mother abandoned us, my father abandoned us and I had a lot of rage and a lot of pain. And so I got into it and I asked for a lot of empathy and a lot of Marshall's time. Like a lot of his attention went to me, helped me heal like for five, the first five days. He mainly focused on me. <laughs> and um, it was a bit disconcerting to the other members of the, uh, of the workshop. They were getting a little upset. <laughs> and at one point I was so, hopeless and despairing about ever healing this wound, particularly with, with the, the feminine. I, I, I remember at one point, Marshall got tired and he decided to take a break and to take a little walk. So he, he we had a break and he took a walk into the woods a little bit to re refresh himself. And I followed him out into the, out into the woods and I kind of cornered him and I said, Marshall, I just don't think this empathy thing is going to work with me. <laughs> I think I'm too wounded. I'm, I have too much hurt to really, you know. And I said, I just, I just really, I just don't think, I think I'm too wounded to be loved. You know, and I was really sad and I put my head down. And then he says to me, he, he has fire in his eyes. He got really angry, really, really more angry than I've ever seen him ever. He get really angry and he screams at me. He says, Kelly, I love you and you won't even take it in. I'm right in front of you. And I'm telling you that I love you, but you're looking at your shoes, telling me how you're never going to be loved, how it's never going to work out. And when he said that to me, with the fire and the rage and the love that was behind it, the sacred rage, then I felt some shift out of my story, out of my woundedness, into the aliveness and the love, the passion, the sacred rage that was right there. Very personal. It wasn't this detached therapist thing. It was Marshall Rosenberg, the soul, wow. meeting people. This is, how he, this is how he did his therapy. Wow. Soul to soul. So I think the honesty helped me more than the empathy at a certain point. But he knew to trust this and to give this. Mm. Rollo May said, all healing begins with empathy, but the real shifts in consciousness come through honesty. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, There's just hundreds of stories like that. You, you travel, yeah, you travel now, all those communities, and you, you're doing this work. And so yeah. I'm sure you always remember him, right? Doing this work now. I feel him with me most of the time. Mm -hmm. I, I feel his presence. I feel his, his spirit. And you know, when he died like a couple years ago, it was amazing, but I, I didn't feel sadness. Mm -hmm. I felt joy. He was free. Not, not that he was free, but that he had an incredibly fully lived life. Well, yeah. He knew how to live life. He, he would heal people all day. He was engaged in the thing he loved the most and give them this amazing consciousness and tool and healing all day. And then at night, he would party. <laughs> he would. He, he's a party animal. Seriously. <laughs> Every night, he'd get together with his friends and he would joke and laugh and make fun of them. And you knew how much he loved you by how much he insulted you. Mm -hmm. That's how I like to show his love, by making fun of the people around him that he could trust, knew where he was coming from. Yes, yes, yes. So it takes a lot of trust to, to get that. Yeah. But he'd heal people all day and party pretty late in the night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very nice. Mm -hmm. It made me happy to think okay. about his life. Wow. And I'm, I'm endeavoring to follow in his footsteps. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Wow. Like even in your community, it was great fun to, mm -hmm. to work with you guys, 
during the day and in the evening to hang out with my colleagues and friends and debrief, talk about the workshop, and play with each other. Nice. nice. It's a good life. Mm. So when you now go to all the different communities, what is so, you know, how is that? I mean, there are many different worlds you're typing into. Are they always the same um, energies which you feel or are they very always different? Always different. Always different and yet always some of the same themes, the same archetypal themes. But they're always at different levels, you could say, mm -hmm. in their development. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. It's, it's both different always and it's the same always. Mm -hmm. what, is your, what is your most inspiring communities uh, you work with now? I worked with now or, or ever have worked with? No, you're most inspiring. I, I, I know you talk about the SEC in, yeah. I think it's in Berlin. So, yeah, Berlin. yeah because uh, you, you think that uh, they are really working well because they have their own forum all the time, also when you are not there, right? That's correct. That's true. Mm -hmm. They use the tools. That's really what I, I love to do is come and share what I call tribal technologies. Right. I call ZEG Forum one of the tribal technologies, one of the great tribal technologies. And mm -hmm. I like to come to a community and feel out what do they need? What tools do they need for the building they are building? Right. Do they need a hammer? No, they already have nonviolent communication. So what else do they need? They need a shovel. Okay, they need for them. I try to, and I actually try to learn new ones mm -hmm. as much as I can and gather them and collect them. I gathered a new one last night. It was just beautiful called the Rosen method. And so I'm going to learn that so I can share that with the communities that need that. But it's kind of like different medicines. Yeah. And I bring the medicine that that particular community needs for their issues. Beautiful. Um, you know, maybe one question also, um, as the seminar you're doing here is free for everybody to join who's also not in our community now. Um, you know, maybe you can explain what the people get when they come to a community and to work with that, even they are not part of that community if they come from outside. Well, a couple things. One is these issues are kind of universal. Mm -hmm. So people come to do this work and be engaged in these different issues. Like a big one for some people is their ability to trust their own self-expression, mm -hmm. to be transparent, to be themselves, to be authentic. So that's a universal issue in almost every community. So anybody who comes to the workshop can work on their own individual issues, say self-expression, or maybe around money. Often there's stuff around money or relationship dynamics love and sexuality. So we can work with any of these things on the individual level and people can grow and have their experience, personal transformational experience. Right. And the second thing is tools, whether it's healing tools like empathy or whether it's um, more constructual kind of tools about victim perpetrator rescue dynamics of, of the drama triangle. So there's And I'll kind of figure out what, what this community is bubbling up, what this community needs, which tool it needs. So you'll learn about different kinds of tools, the exposure, some exposure, like a sampler platter for maybe 12 different tribal technologies, as well as your individual personal transformation work. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm really looking forward. And, you know, I would love to do also another time in interview if you are interested just about the nonviolent communication because that's yeah. very very big issue you know because I have to I say you know that in the beginning it sounded nice and then I did some um, trials you know I, I tried some some things and then I also came to my boundaries you know like something where if you know, I cannot say that now nonviolent <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> I, I really, uh, yeah. uh, because, you know, as you said, your book, like, don't be nice, be real. That is for me yeah. more easy than uh, saying things nonviolent. I, I realize that now and it doesn't feel always nice. Say, say it again, the last part. You said that, that it is more difficult to, to be real than... No, I no. I didn't get that. 
No, no, for me personally, it's more nice, it's more easy to be real, and I have more problems to okay. say it non-violent, and uh, I just yeah, yeah. realized that, and I, I really have some questions about that. Um, how to? Well, I really think you have the better problem. <laughs> if I had to choose which problem to have, I would choose your problem. <laughs> okay. Because my problem is being a doormat. A what? Your problem, a doormat. Like, oh. like a rug that people walk over and okay. you're just too nice and people walk over you. Oh, okay, okay. And if you grow a little bit in consciousness, then you become obnoxious. Mm -hmm. Then you become, you kind of like lash out or you just, you express yourself violently, but at least you don't let people walk over you. Yeah. It's easier. Gandhi said one time, Gandhi said when somebody came to join his peace movement, he said, but can you be angry? Can you be violent? Can you be in your power? And the young man would say no. And then Gandhi would say, well, go join the army for a couple of years and then come back. Oh my gosh. <laughs> really? Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. I mean, it's also not, not always like this, but sometimes when I'm really upset, I, I really think, you know, there's a map of how to do nonviolent communication. And then yeah. I see the map, okay, here I missed a step, here I missed a step. I just set it out and mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> I think it takes a lot of um, practice. And I also, you know, sometimes I just don't want to go about the map, you know. Then I think, okay, now stop. Um, then I have to think all the things through. And then I don't know, then I don't say it out immediately so i think to find a balance about that is uh, for me personally it's, it's really i'm thinking a lot about that how to how to manage mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well i like what marsha would say about it first thing you say is remember what the buddha said don't just do something sit there yes. so after you've been triggered to hold it to let it be there the rage the hurt the pain the fear the, all the the truth around it until you can get conscious of your needs. So you can get conscious, what am I needing here? Am I needing understanding? Am I needing honesty? Am I needing safety? Whatever. As best I can. And um, But then I want to bring myself to an awareness of how to get my needs met effectively. And not say something that makes it less likely I'm going to get my needs met. So I like to wait until I can say it in a way that fosters trust and connection. It, it will make that person more likely to want to hear me. How can I express myself in a way that, that grows the trust, that grows the connection, that grows the understanding? And when that comes to me, then I, I like to wait till I can express it that way. Mm -hmm. So I do it for selfish reasons, not because I'm trying to be nice to the other person, <laughs> because I want to get my need. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, especially I had one interview one time when I was in the car um, about Marshall and about like how you can have empathy like for actually bad person. Like, I mean, where's the boundary? If somebody is, you know, dropping an atomic boundary? bomb, you know, how to have empathy for that being, you know, I mean, we're, well, it's you know? really, 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 really important that we learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. I would like all of us to take a big class on how to have empathy for Donald Trump. And I'd like to lead the class because mm -hmm. if we don't give the empathy to that, what's driving those kinds of impulses, then what's going to stop it from happening? Right. So it's really, really important. And on one level, it's not that hard for me to, to, to understand what, what could be going on behind somebody who drops a bomb, an atomic bomb. I've actually studied a little bit about what was going on politically, the fear and the, the name calling and the demonizing and the enemy images that both sides, both sides were creating towards each other during the time leading up to the dropping of the bombs. So. It's a good practice, and I think it even relates to inner dynamics, spiritual dynamics that we could look at inside ourselves. 
that apply to more situations than just the political situation. Anytime we want to demonize somebody, anytime we want to make somebody appear wrong, yes. that's the dynamics that create the atomic bombs. Yes, wow, yes. So where do we drop our uh, um, atomic bombs? Uh, bombs? Yes. Yeah. Every time we try to make somebody wrong, mm -hmm. every time we try to diminish someone's reputation in a group, anytime we try to disempower somebody, mm -hmm. we're engaging in the same dynamics that ended up in the violence. Yes. Wow. Okay. And also in group. Yes. I, I really am. I have to say, you know, it's it's um, so beautiful uh, brain food for me right now uh, to remind me on so many things. And wow, good way to go still. Mm. Yeah. And there's the learning I'm getting lately is that the groups can get started with a certain kind of fear-based um, communication. They're, they're afraid about what's happening and they, they want to, ha to react, react quickly and just from, from their own reactivity to do something quickly about scary things happening in the community. And then people get afraid and they start to go in a spiral. I call it a limbic fear spiral. They start to get more and, more and they trigger each other to more and more fear. And pretty soon you have a whole group of people that's wanting to do violence to somebody. It's wanting to, to take action quickly. And the learning is there's some tribal technologies that people could have that could bring to those groups that help people drop down out of their fear-based thinking of enemy images and, oh my God, we've got to do something. This is terrible what's happening. And drop down back into this place of great power, this place of groundedness, this place of source, this place of trust, this place of knowing that knows exactly what to do. But we've got to uh, apply, even to the group, uh, some technologies to even like music to slow us down, to bring us back inside, to connect even physically with our hands to touch each other, put our hands on each other's backs, something to start to bring us back into connection with source. Connection with life. And then we're much more likely to do something nonviolent than we are when we're all caught up in being hijacked, being kidnapped into this hologram of fear. But we can find our way back to the hologram of trust. Mm -hmm. And then we can serve forces of peace in the world. Then we can have the, the power of love instead of the love of power. Beautiful, Kelly. Beautiful. I say many, many thanks for this beautiful interview. And are you, are you willing to do a second one in a few weeks with me? Because sure. it's beautiful. Sure. It's so Can inspiring. I mention on this one? I just thought of it. Can I mention my website? Just, yeah, to beyond it. just if you want to find out about me and my schedule and what I'm up to in Europe, no. um, or just some good resources different audios and videos and books and different things, you can go to my website, www.languageofcompassion.com. And you can find out. Yes. I'm find out how to order my book. Don't yeah, be nice order to your order. book. Where, where we can order your book? Yeah. You can get off Amazon, by the way. You have your book also in German available? Or only yes, it is. Oh. It's through Jungfermann. Okay. Jungfermann, Jungfermann is the press, but... I think you can get it through Amazon Germany too. Okay, we, we put the link under the YouTube here. Yeah, it's in uh, German. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, and who wants to come to us? You are here now. When you see this video, you, you will be here already in May. Wow, wow, wow. Mm -hmm. This is not long ago. Um, mm -hmm. That is very nice. Bye. May. And if you see this video later, maybe even ongoing, I hope so. Um, because now when we do the video it's 2018 but this video will be online on YouTube so if you see that you can contact Kelly directly or us and yeah get more information so thank you so much um, I like to do a um, peace mantra 
And Wonderful. Beautiful. It's, it's like Om Shanti. Um, yes. And it's a mantra we say, peace for us, peace for the people we know, and peace for the whole world, and peace for all living beings. Om Shanti 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 Loka Samasta Sukino Pavantu Loka Samasta Sukino Pavantu Loka Samasta Sukino Pavantu Om Shanti 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 Shanti